I'm watching the numbers too, and I see 123 people on this call and many familiar names to me. So I really appreciate you all taking time out of your schedule to join on a Thursday night to talk about George Meade and specifically about the pursuit from Gettysburg. I have a PowerPoint, so I'm gonna flip over and screen share. Can you all see that okay? Yep. Yep. Right, perfect, thank you. So I appreciate the offer to speak to you all tonight and um, the winner of George Meade uh, 2023 kicks off. I'll be joining you again in, in March to talk about Meade and the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War. But tonight we're gonna talk about certainly one of my favorite topics associated with George Meade, uh, certainly with the Gettysburg campaign, but perhaps all of his command in the Civil War. Uh, Rich mentioned that I worked at Gettysburg as a seasonal park ranger, and it would often be the case, and, and I hear this more, I'm certainly more aware or sensitive to it, that people coming to the battlefield and talking about the campaign would think that there was no action by the Army of the Potomac after July 3rd. You hear that Pinard all the time. Uh, George Meade and the Army of the Potomac, they didn't pursue. Meade didn't pursue to the Potomac River, which we know is absolute nonsense. And if my book, when it's published, can do a little bit to recorrect that narrative, I'll be very happy in doing so. So what I aim to share with you tonight, I have a chapter in my book on the pursuit from Gettysburg, is the action from July the 4th, and since we're talking about Meade and the Army of the Potomac, I bumped the pursuit date out to July the 19th, 1863, which is when the Army of the Potomac has crossed the Potomac River and sitting on the South Bank in Virginia um, by the 19th. So I'm gonna go over this um, basically two week period with you tonight and keep our focus on Meade, keep our focus on the Army of the Potomac, and see what this pursuit entailed. But before we get into all the detail and the nuance of the period from July 4th to the 19th, I wanna start with a maybe simple, but hopefully reflective premise, um, a context, a point of context, if you will. At the Battle of Gettysburg, the Army of the Potomac, commanded by Major General George Meade, defeated Robert E. Lee in the Army of Northern Virginia. It's a Union victory. We know that to be true. But we take that victory and the pursuit, and we ask for, in 1863, Lincoln in the North, they ask for something more. Something rather than just defeating Lee, the Northern public and President Lincoln, and certainly future detractors of General Meade expected him to do more. And in the way in which defeat isn't enough, that the Army of the Potomac was supposed to destroy, annihilate the enemy, the Army of Northern Virginia. And I will pose to you, and many of you are not just students of the American Civil War, but you're students of American military history, or even military history in Europe or Asia, that destroying your enemy on a battlefield is one of the rarest feats in all of military history. That single grand stroke, something like Waterloo in 1815, is incredibly rare. Combine that, let's say, battle of annihilation with expecting an army to then pivot on a pursuit and launch a successful pursuit is even more rare. And you might wonder why in the heck I have a slide here when I'm talking about George Meade about the American Revolution. And I would encourage you to think in your mind tonight, ruminate on this point where you can point to an example in American military history or world military history, where a general was able 
to defeat the enemy on the battlefield and then turn around, marshal his army, launch it on a pursuit and successfully bag the enemy. That is incredibly rare. The image I have here in the painting is of the Battle of Saratoga. And in early October, 1777, the uh, colonial general, General Gates, is able to defeat the British army, John Burgoyne, at Saratoga, pivot the army, launch a pursuit, catch up with the British, surround them, and get Burgoyne to surrender. That's the painting we're looking at here at the Schuyler House. General Burgoyne surrenders just about 6,000 British officers and men, which at that time constitute about 20% of all the British forces in the colonies. That's a battlefield victory coupled with a successful pursuit that wipe an entire army off the plate during the American Revolution. That rarely happens. That rarely happens. And I've made in that point with a quote here from uh, perhaps a famous name to you, George Templeton Strong on July the 5th. And look at the rhetoric. Just suppose that Meade should bag Lee and his horde of traitors as Burgoyne and Cornwallis were bagged near a century ago. We'll come back to this point at the end, but I like to frame my conversation about the pursuit with getting a sense of expectations, getting a sense of what's realistic to achieve, and then also getting a sense of decisive battle and effective pursuits, not just in the Civil War, but in American military history until this time. It's a very rare feat. I think if we understand that, the pursuit from Gettysburg adds some texture and some nuance to it. You can agree or disagree with me when we get to the Q&As. On July the 5th, Meade writes his first letter back home and he uses a language similar to what we just saw from George Templeton Strong when he writes, it was a grand battle and in my judgment is a most decided victory. And look at the language, though I did not annihilate or bag the Confederate army. And as we'll see through the course of our program tonight, that is certainly the expectation that Commander in Chief Abraham Lincoln has. And it's certainly the expectation that is fueled by the Northern media, the press. If, however, you were to survey the letters of many men in the Army of the Potomac on July 3rd and 4th, you would find that they were more than satisfied with Meade's leadership during the battle. Uh, William Brook Rawl, or William Rawl Brook, depending on when you're citing him, writes, Meade had done splendidly. And that sentiment was widely shared at the close of the battle. Not to maybe overstate a, a simple point, but taking Meade's leadership in the Gettysburg campaign and moving it forward during the pursuit and the Army of the Potomac, when defeating Robert E. Lee, does so at a cost of about 23,000 casualties. Uh, Union soldiers killed, wounded, or captured eclipse 23,000. And on July the 4th, Independence Day, will be a busy day for General Meade. It is clear that the Army of the Potomac is not going to affect a pursuit right away when Meade gives an order that the army will refit and rest for today. Meade's pretty busy though on July the 4th. Uh, basically the Union and Confederate Army will hold the positions that they've had on the 3rd, Cemetery Ridge for the Union Army, Seminary Ridge for Lee's Army, and Meade will start to gather intelligence, reconnaissance. He wants to start to learn more about Lee's intentions. Is Lee, withdrawing into the mountains as he's starting to move back to Virginia, he's going to gather intelligence. He's going to start to take care of prisoner of war question, and he's going to start to resupply his army. These Union soldiers have been on the march for days. The men in the Army of the Potomac are exhausted. They need rest. They need resupplied. They need food, which finally 
these supplies are starting to roll up the Baltimore Pike now on July the 4th. So that day, Independence Day, is a busy one for George Meade. He will issue a note of congratulations to the men in his army. I've captured it on the left. It's in the official records. I'm sure many of you have seen it. And in this note of congratulations, Meade will write um, a sentence, one sentence, that later will catch the ire of President Lincoln. Our task is not yet accomplished. And the line that Lincoln doesn't like is the one where Meade says, the army will make greater efforts to drive from our soil every vestige of the presence of the invader. Lincoln is not gonna like that particular line, believing that Meade doesn't really understand what our soil actually means. But right now, Meade has a lot to be proud of. He took command of the Army of the Potomac on June 28th. He concentrated the Army of the Potomac at Gettysburg and he defeated Robert E. Lee. At this point, this is the Army of the Potomac's signature victory. What happens next? And that's where Meade's reputation, his star rises so suddenly and maybe for, for reasons that are not fair, his star will start to decline in large part through his actions and perceptions on the pursuit. On July 4, Meade is gonna call a council of war. This will be the second one of the campaign. I suspect many of you are familiar with the July 2nd council of war at the Leicester House. This one is on the 4th, and the composition looks a little different than what we saw on the second at the Leicester House. I put a photograph of Brigadier General Thomas Neal here on the left. Um, he commands a brigade in the Sixth Corps, and this council of war will take place at Neal's headquarters. Underneath him, of course, is Dan Butterfield, uh, still acting as the chief of staff. On the far right is Major General David Burney, who now represents the Third Corps after Sickles wounding on the second, and Brigadier General William Hayes replacing uh, Winfield Scott Hancock. These generals, 10 of them, will gather around eight o'clock in the evening and they will start to discuss what next? What do we do? We abandon the battlefield after Lee, that way it's clear that we are the victors. How long should we remain in Gettysburg? And specifically, what line of pursuit should we take? And that's an important question. This is a map you've probably seen before. I think this is one of Hal Jesperson's maps that shows us the line that Robert E. Lee will take um, in the red, getting his army of Northern Virginia back down ultimately to Virginia. And then in the blue, you can see the route that the Union Army will take. A couple of points here I wanna make. Um, one, when we think about the pursuit, remember that when Meade took command, Halleck and Lincoln gave Meade a tremendous amount of latitude in how to maneuver the Army of the Potomac well, with one caveat, one big exception. He had to protect Washington, D.C. We talk about that in the campaign, but that order is still true in the pursuit. Meade has to maneuver in a way that keeps Washington, D.C. safe. So essentially, he has two options. Meade can take the Army of the Potomac and directly follow Lee. Directly follow Lee. Or he can move the Army of the Potomac on a route parallel. And that is what Meade is going to decide. It means the men in the Army of the Potomac will take a longer route. They're going to have more marching to do to get down to the Potomac River. But ultimately, once they, once they get down to Middletown, uh, just outside of Frederick, they will have access to the National Road, which is macadamized. And importantly, as Meade is considering this question, he has to think about his supply base. Meade can't afford to act hastily or be impetuous because he has to make sure that the Army of the Potomac supply base is accessible. He can't afford to make a mistake. So keeping supplies in mind, using the railroad, maneuvering towards Frederick on a parallel route is ultimately 
what the Union High Command will decide. We are mostly going to follow the, well, mostly Meade, of course, but we're mostly going to follow the actions and the route of the infantry. But I don't want to leave a thought um, on the pursuit without mentioning, of course, the role of Alfred Pleasanton and the Army's cavalry. Some of you I know are really steeped in Civil War history. I know you also have some familiarity with 19th century military theory. I suspect reading some people like Jean Manet or Clausewitz, you have familiarity with this. And if you read some 19th century military theory, they all talk about the role of the cavalry and how that arm has to be effective. And scholars have written on this too. No doubt you have read Eric Wittenberg's book, um, which is pretty much the standard on the cavalry and the pursuit. And he will argue in the book, and, and this is certainly my conclusion too, that Pleasanton's cavalry, I don't wanna say impotent, because that might be too strong of a word, but it doesn't render the sort of assistance necessary on the pursuit. There's no unity in purpose. The guy on the left is of course General Kilpatrick and he will take a more prominent role in the pursuit, uh, Meade's directions to harass and annoy. Um, Kilpatrick will achieve that. And the first battle of the pursuit is fought on July 4th, the night of, and in the morning on July the 5th at Monterey Pass. Uh, we're looking, of course, at a map here on the left of the Battle at Monterey Pass, just on the west side of Gettysburg. Kilpatrick has about 4,500 men. He will take those men and harass Ewell's uh, wagons and the rear guard as they are trying to get over the South Mountain. This is a battle you might have some familiarity with, and it's one that's certainly defined by weather. If you look at the top two images in my PowerPoint, uh, particularly the middle one, you can see the driving rain and the darkness is really gonna define this battle. Uh, the driving rain defines the pursuit. The weather very much plays a role for both Meade and Lee. Next time, if you haven't been out to Monterey Pass yet, next time you're down in the Gettysburg area, head on down Route 116 and visit Monterey Pass. They have a wonderful museum. I've thrown a picture in here on the bottom right. They have a nice walking trail system and you can learn a little more about this action on the 4th and the 5th and what Kilpatrick accomplishes here on that night. We're gonna leave uh, mostly now the cavalry and we're gonna pivot our attention more to the infantry. And of course, I'm gonna privilege Meade and his decision-making as we go forward. But I wanted to mention this so you have a sense of Pleasanton and the role that they play in the pursuit. The first movement from the infantry is going to involve the Union Army's Sixth Corps. Uh, this, of course, commanded by Major General John Sedgwick, who you see on the left. This is a smart move to make the Sixth Corps uh, the tip of the spear, to use a modern term, the tip of the spear, because the Sixth Corps had been relatively undamaged, if you will, or unengaged during the battle. They have less than 2% casualties during the Gettysburg campaigns. So this is a pretty fresh core. And what Meade wants John Sedgwick to do is to effect a reconnaissance in force. And I've thrown the, the order in that Sedgwick receives for his actions here on the 5th. Um, the orders are for reconnaissance with a view to ascertain the position and the movement of the enemy, not for battle. So Sedgwick's objective is to discern conclusively if Lee is moving into the mountains, if he's strengthening his position, if he's intending to offer battle around Fairfield. This is a probe. And Sedgwick sets off to achieve that goal. 
Take a look at where Gettysburg sits on the map, the top right here, the roads, intersections, you know, spokes on the wheel. And then move your eyes down to the middle left and you'll see the small village of Fairfield. And this is Route 116. And I've superimposed Sedgwick here in the gold arrow. What will happen is that the six core will start moving out at about 11 o'clock in the morning on July the 5th to ascertain Lee's intent and his position. And before they get to Fairfield, they're gonna have a skirmish at a little rise or a hill along the Fairfield Road called Granite Hill. And this will be about six o'clock in the evening. I borrowed the map here from Eric Wittenberg's book, One Continuous Fight, which gives us a nice um, tactical sense of this fight at Granite Hill. And you can see the position of the sixth core here on the right, the darker black boxes and arrows. And then you can see the second core, Yule's guys off on the left. The impact of this skirmish is significant. It's about five miles outside of Gettysburg, about two miles out from Fairfield. If you're driving out 116, there's a little um, campground there today. The impact of this is, is significant because what it means to Meade is uncertainty. And Meade, who's remaining in Gettysburg, is going to get information back from that skirmish that makes him anxious and uncertain about Lee's intentions. The top image is, of course, Governor K. Warren, the hero of Little Round Top, and the Army's chief engineer. Warren had accompanied Sedgwick and the Sixth Corps on this movement west. Warren's gonna return to Army headquarters and debrief Meade on the skirmish. And it makes Meade reconsider or ruminate further on Lee's intentions. Is he gonna concentrate, like I said, in Fairfield? Is he gonna try to offer battle again? What, what is the enemy doing? And this might seem like indecision on Meade's part, but there's a great quote by a military scholar who says that so much of being a leader is a quest for certainty. You wanna be certain before you act. I mean, the stakes are enormous here. And that's what Meade's seeking, he's seeking certainty. So the consequence of this skirmish is twofold. One, as you can see on the screen, Meade is gonna explain to Sedgwick, probe again. Um, probe again, this, this will be on the, the following day. But more so, Meade is gonna halt on July the 7th, the Army of the Potomac. He had previously given an order for the Army of the Potomac to start to move towards Middletown uh, near Frederick, and he will rescind this order, halt the Army's Corps, their drive south. The Army of the Potomac will halt for 30 hours until Meade is certain of Lee's intentions. And when he gets that certainty from Sedgwick's probe the next day, he will order the Infantry Corps to continue their advance. And ultimately, same map I showed you a minute ago, they will concentrate just outside of Frederick. We can see here where the blue arrows are converging with the supplies coming in more, more readily um, the following day, uh, the 7th and into the 8th. And I wanna make a point here, this is really gonna be underscored in a couple slides. The March, from Gettysburg for the men in the Army of the Potomac is miserable. It's miserable. And we talk so much about the condition of the Confederates. We talk so much about the condition of Lee's army, both on the move to Gettysburg and the move from Gettysburg. Confederates, destitute, lone supplies, horrible position for the rebel soldiers. All those characteristics are true for the Union men. Howard and Slocum are writing that I'll half of the men in their corps. Do you have anything to eat? We just ate. We just, huh? Everybody just had their own thing. Left and Ron had an egg. And uh, it will cook something. Rich, should I, uh, should I pause?
I want to know where it's in. Close the door, please. Okay. Um, half of the men in the 11th and 12th Corps are without shoes. And you can see some of this correspondence in the official records of how destitute, low on supplies these federal soldiers are. Meade writes to Halleck about this on July the 8th. And he says, my army has been making forced marches, shorter rations and barefoot. Corps marched yesterday overnight, 30 miles. And then he says, I take this as an opportunity to repeat, I'll do the most that I can to push forward this army. The weather, the relentless driving rain, keep in mind too, this is after fighting a three-day battle. And the Army of the Potomac marched to get to Gettysburg. So the sheer exhaustion is really starting to mount. We need to keep that in mind. Meade himself will arrive to Frederick. Um, and this is a photograph I took summer before last, poking around on some Meade sites. The building that sits here, this is the United States Hotel. It's red brick building with the red awning. And this is where Meade will be making temporary headquarters and spending the night here on the 8th. And across the street is the B&O Railroad Station. So he's close to the telegraph communication. And if you're in Frederick, um, pop around. This is on um, South Market and All Saints Street. And you can see this. I'm gonna share with you um, a letter that Meade writes once he gets into the hotel here on my next slide, but I wanted to give you a perspective from his son. And the man in the image is Meade's son, also named George Meade. Um, this is captain on his staff. And he's writing some letters back home to Margaret in Philadelphia. He writes about how warmly Meade is greeted when he gets into Frederick, how they're showering him with bouquets and kisses. And then he writes to his mom and he says, Papa will end the war. The man named Meade is quite well and notwithstanding his hard work looks well. When Meade gets settled in at the United States Hotel, he has an opportunity to write a letter to Margaret. And this is one of my favorite letters of, of the hundreds that I've read of, of Meade. This is one of my favorites because it gives us this perfect window into Meade's mental and physical state. And I took a few sentences here to share it with you. He says, from the time I took command until today, now over 10 days, I have not changed my clothes, not had a regular night's rest, and many nights not a wink of sleep. For several days did not even wash my face and hands, no regular food, and all the time in a great state of mental anxiety. Indeed, I think I have lived as much in this time as in the last 30 years. What a powerful letter. What a powerful letter. And thinking of the mental, physical, emotional, spiritual exhaustion on me, and there's still work to be done. There's still work to be done. Perhaps the hardest work is yet to be done. So Meade's kept pace on the pursuit, moving his headquarters to Frederick, and his exhaustion is mirrored by the men in his ranks. And I've taken just a sampling here. You can find numerous, countless soldier accounts, uh, Army of the Potomac men on the pursuit writing about how miserable it is. I'm just giving you a, a sample of a, a plethora of accounts. Francis Adams Donaldson, you probably have his memoirs on your shelf, 118th Pennsylvania. My boots have been worn out for some time and I'm now barefoot nearly. Wilbur Fisk, who's talking about getting across South Mountain, second New Hampshire, um, with a degree of hyperbole, perhaps he says, Napoleon crossing the Alps will no longer be mentioned as the climax of heroic achievements. Sedgwick crossing Kentucky Mountains has eclipsed that. Then for a little bit of context, as a reminder, James Biddle, fellow Philadelphian, Pennsylvanian on Meade's staff, says the Army of the Potomac has marched and countermarched without one day's rest ever since we left the Rappahannock. 
let's not shortchange the experience of the men of the Army of the Potomac on the pursuit. Supplies, absolutely imperative. Um, here I've selected two quotes relative to horses and mules. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Kent Masterson Brown's book on mead. You've probably also read Kent Masterson's Brown, um, his book on the um, retreat, retreat from Gettysburg, the one that focuses on Lee. He estimates in his research that the Army of the Potomac lost 15,000 horses and mules during the Gettysburg campaign. 15,000 horses and mules during the campaign. So Meade is frantically trying to work with officials in DC, the quartermasters and such, to get horses and mules to move his army. And they start arriving, trickling in, but look at the accounts here. 8th Pennsylvania, Calvary, Captain Winsters, the horses are growing so thin and weak, I sometimes think they will never rally. Poor defiance is about done, and so is my mayor. The member of Meade's staff, Charles Cadwallader, on July 10th, he says, I'm rather badly off for horse flesh at present. This is a sampling again of many shared sentiment. Many shared sentiment. I wanna come back to a point that I introduced on my second slide and my third slide where I said about Saratoga and Waterloo and decisive battle. I wanna make a point here about the Northern media, the journalists, the papers, and how they're covering Meade and the drive to the Potomac. The image on the left comes from the Philadelphia Inquirer and I think I show this in just about every talk I do because it's such a wonderful point to make. The mask says victory, but right here, Waterloo eclipsed. This is July the 6th, printing this. Now, we might not think much about Waterloo in 2023, but let me tell you, the analogies to the Napoleonic campaigns are ubiquitous in 1860s. And for people in the 1860s to equate Gettysburg with Waterloo is significant. Waterloo, 1815, recent memory. It's a battle in which Napoleon is finally vanquished, completely changes the geopolitical strategy of Western Europe. By God, the expectations then placed on George Meade to compare to Waterloo. But it's not just the Philadelphia newspaper. Look at the Detroit Free Press. Meade of course, closely connected to Detroit beginning the war, the defeat of Lee must be a fatal blow to the rebellion. Then over on the right, Meade victorious. The great battle near Gettysburg, the media is lavishing praise on Meade, deservingly, right? But they're fueling these expectations along the way. And then you get the news from Vicksburg. Remember, now I'm an Eastern theater historian, but remember that Vicksburg is certainly gonna amp up expectations for Meade that Grant, who can take the surrender of what, 20 some thousand of John Pemberton's Confederates completely bags an army. Now look at Lincoln's words on the 7th. If Meade can complete his work the by the literal or substantial destruction of the army, the rebellion will be over. So Lincoln here on the 7th believes that if Meade can bag Lee's army, if Meade can bag Lee's army, the Civil War will be over. And the expectations just increase. The pressure just increases. <clears throat> when you have time, uh, thumb through some of the correspondence in the official record if you're interested in this topic between Meade and Halleck, it's really enlightening. And you can see Meade's uh, frustration growing with what he thinks is unreasonable expectations. Meade gets a correspondence from Halleck on the 7th. You've given the enemy a stunning blow at Gettysburg, now go follow it up. Meade cautions the next day, 
I wish to moderate expectations of those who in ignorance of the difficulties encountered may expect too much. Moderate expectations. Meade is getting frustrated with political meddling and he realizes ignorance of the difficulties encountered. The Army of the Potomac is changed since he took command. It's changed in leadership. It's weakened and exhausted by the battle and the pursuit. The weather magnifies all this misery. This is an image, top line, top line, showing us the Union High Command Corps commanders when Meade took command on the 28th. The bottom set of faces show what has changed. That's July the 7th. So the first, second, and third corps have new corps commanders. Newton, Hayes, and French, new to the position, 5th, 6th, 11th, and 12th remain the same. Meade will write uh, several times actually to, to uh, Margaret in Philadelphia where he writes about a, a, a quote, want of corps commanders. Now, we could probably agree that French is an improvement over Sickles, right? Probably agree. But I'm not sure any of us are willing to say that William Hayes, not Alexander, but William Hayes, is an improvement over Hancock. And I don't think any of us would argue that John Newton is a replacement for John Reynolds. So the composition of his most trusted officers has changed significantly and arguably not for the better. Meade has had an opportunity, however, to make an improvement on the chief of staff position. You are familiar that um, Butterfield is wounded He's temporarily going to be uh, that position filled by uh, Governor K. Warren. But then finally, on July the 8th, Major General Andrew Humphreys steps in as chief of staff. Fellow topographical engineer, fellow Philadelphian and Pennsylvanian, and a man who is more than capable at the task at hand. Absolutely excellent choice and will be uh, really through the rest of the war, one of Meade's most trusted confidants and one of his most talented men in the inner circle. So I want us to get to a point, and I'm, I'm watching my time too, so I don't go over too much. I want us to get to a point where we can get to the, the culminating point, if you will. I'm not going to walk through all the battles of the pursuit with you. There's fighting at Smithsburg, there's fighting in Hagerstown, there's fighting in Funkstown. But I want the armies ultimately to get to their final positions, to their battle lines along the Potomac River. Um, Meade will have the Army of the Potomac concentrating in Boonesboro on July the 9th, and Lee's taking a position that will run from Hagerstown which is about eight miles to the Potomac, um, south down to the Potomac River. If you sometimes hear this called the Hagerstown Downsville line. Lee's line is about nine miles long, north to south, end to end, and he has maybe 50,000 men in that position. We'll talk about how they've dug in here in just a second. The Union Army is in a parallel line uh, roughly about a mile and a half or two miles away. And the Confederates in that Hagerstown Downsville line, uh, maybe amped up by the press too, have dug in and they are in no way demoralized. We get this, this notion that they're so badly defeated at Gettysburg that the Army of Northern Virginia is just one more punch away from complete collapse. That's not the case. Uh, read Confederate soldiers' accounts on the move back towards the Potomac and their resolve is as strong as ever, right? Amped up here by Lee himself in an address to his men on July the 11th. But Lee finds himself in a bit of predicament. His back is to the river. It has poured down rain, as I said more than once, and the river level at the Potomac has increased. Uh, not safe to cross, but Weather's changed a little bit, and now the water levels are starting to recede. So Lee's thinking, how can I affect an escape 
across the Potomac River. The, the time is coming. Confederates, in the meantime, have dug in. And I suspect you're familiar with this, how strong Lee's defenses are in and around the Downsville Hagerstown line. I'll share some other quotes with you, but this is from Charles Wainwright, the, um, the diarist, the artillerist, who on the 14th says that those positions were by far the strongest I've yet seen, laid out by engineers and built as if they were meant to stand a month's siege. So when we talk about Meade's actions here at Williamsport, what we're really discussing is whether or not Meade should have ordered his men to launch a frontal assault against a entrenched position. And I think any student, a thoughtful student of the Civil War can tell you that frontal assaults barely, very rarely work. So Meade's gonna have to decide what to do. The pursuit has reached a culminating point and he's gonna have to decide what his next step is. This is a photograph I took uh, this summer at Devil's Backbone. And if you're interested in tracking these sites of the pursuit, you can. Um, so much good work has been done by Civil War trails and you can kind of construct the movement of Meade and the Army of the Potomac, and you can visit Devil's Backbone um, close to the Antietam battlefield. This is the site of the third and final Council of War, the Gettysburg Campaign. This will be held on July the 12th. There's a nice wayside marker there to tell you more about it. Meade, I'll give you a slide on the Council of War in a minute, but Meade is keeping Halleck and Lincoln informed of the progress of the pursuit. And at 4.30 in the afternoon on July the 12th, this is the message that Meade sends to Halleck, 4.30. It is my intention to attack them tomorrow unless something intervenes to prevent it for the reason that delay will strengthen the enemy and will not increase my force. So he intends to attack tomorrow unless something intervenes. And at eight o'clock in the evening, Meade gathers his generals for the third and final council of war. And in this council, they discuss whether or not they should attack Lee's position. And the composition of this council it looks similar to what we saw on the second um, at the Leicester House, similar to what happens on the fourth where we started, but with some important changes. Uh, John Newton is ill, so he's replaced. Uh, First Corps is going to be James Wadsworth, Newton's sick. And Alfred Pleasanton will be there, although officially he's not part of the council or doesn't have a vote. And the people present will vote to attack or not. And the three I have on the screen, Wadsworth, Pleasanton, and Howard, vote to attack the Confederate line. Those are the three. I suspect you know that in the winter of 1864, February, March, and April, 64, Meade is going to be brought up by the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War. We'll talk about that in March. And a lot of what is going to be questioned at this congressional testimony is Meade's leadership in the Gettysburg campaign here in the pursuit and his use of councils of war. So we get a lot of why he did this and decision-making that winter in March. And I'm sharing with you one of those quotes. And Meade says, I left it to their judgment and would not, unless it met with their approval, this is an attack on the Confederate line, do it. So rather than I intend to attack tomorrow. Now, Meade sends a message to Halleck that you have to imagine he surely um, knew would be met with rebuke. He says, upon calling my corps commanders together and submitting the question of them, five out of six were opposed to it. So the 13th then, rather than being a day for an attack, is spent in surveying the lines. General Meade, General Humphreys, 
will do a reconnaissance. Meade comes back to Army headquarters. This is what he wires to DC. And then at nine o'clock, orders go out for the Corps commanders the following day on the 14th to organize a reconnaissance in force. Um, one division from four corps to begin at seven o'clock on the morning of the 14th. Well, when Halleck gets the message about the Council of War, he's outraged. Famous often quoted line, act upon your own judgment, call no council of war. It is proverbial that councils of war never fight. Well, rather than have the opportunity for those four divisions at 7 a.m. on July 14th to effect a reconnaissance in force, at 6.30 in the morning, this is the 14th, um, General Howard messages to Army headquarters that the Confederates have abandoned their lines in his front. Lee's escaped. And now Meade in, is in a completely reactive position. By one o'clock on the 14th, the Army of the Potomac has sort of watched um, the enemy slip or escape back into Virginia. Lee's army sits on the south side by one o'clock in the afternoon. And now you have a complete deterioration of the relationship between Halleck, Lincoln, and Meade. And I wanna spend just a few slides on that to kind of nicely give that closure to Meade in the pursuit. This I'm sure you're familiar with is Meade at 2.30 offering his resignation. It's not the first time, or I'm sorry, it's not the last time, it's the first time, but not the last time that Meade will offer to resign. Halleck, of course, doesn't accept it. And this is a bit of a crisis in civil military relations. And Meade, who feels that he has been unfairly probed and prodded and so much political meddling and interference in military matters believes that he has not been justly treated. Lincoln, who has viewed the Gettysburg campaign through this lens of decisive victory, bagging the enemy, battles of annihilation, do what Grant did, Lincoln is beside himself when he hears of the news. And he writes a letter, one that he doesn't send to Meade, that he pours out his emotion about Meade and the actions on the Potomac River. I think, and I'd be curious, maybe when we get to the questions, um, Lincoln's tone is rather condescending. Again, my dear general, I do not believe you appreciate the magnitude of the misfortune in Lee's escape. Surely Meade does. Surely he appreciates it. And the famous often quoted line, your golden opportunity is gone and I'm distressed immeasurably because of it. He doesn't send it, although I can't imagine that Meade would be surprised at this sentiment had he received it from the commander in chief. Meade fires some letters uh, back home to Margaret on the 14th. And you can see what his framework is, what his frame of mind is. Remember, Meade never wanted command of the Army of the Potomac. He never coveted. And here he is knowing that what he said or what he was expected to do was unreasonable. Look at the, the longer quote. This is exactly what I expected. Unless I did impractical things, fault would be found with me. And he's right. He's absolutely right. There are a panoply of opinions among the rank and file about what happened on the banks of the Potomac River. You can read soldiers' letters and diaries and get various eclectic opinions. We should have attacked, we shouldn't have attacked. I'm giving you a sampling. Francis Adams Donaldson, who I quoted earlier, he says um, he's a little disappointed in Meade's decision. Breaking camp, crossing over the Potomac River, into Virginia, who declare that Old Meade, the four-eyed loafer, is leading them to the graveyard of the Army of the Potomac. First New York Light Artillerist, Lieutenant Ames, 
Sounds like Lincoln. General Meade let the golden opportunity slip and now it is gone. From a civilian, a reverend at the College of St. James, which you can visit today if you go and do some of this pursuit stops. Um, he says, we're very thankful to God and so many in this neighborhood that no battle came here. The enemy were most strongly entrenched and all our army might not have dislodged them. This would have been a serious reverse. Soldier in the 97th New York, Lieutenant Willard B. Judd. I suppose the papers will condemn General Meade in the strongest terms for allowing Lee to escape. Man, was he right about that. Look at the bottom. It is really amusing to see the views that most of the leading journals advance. They all seem to think that after General Lee retreated from Gettysburg, that it was mere play spell to entirely annihilate the rebel army. He was completely bagged in their estimation and all that was necessary was to shoulder the bag and carry it off. But then we came to shoulder it and the contents dropped out. One of my favorite soldier quotes, spot on. So we'll circle back to where we started. And it is a fascinating, if not reductive intellectual exercise to think about should Meade have attacked the Potomac? Could he have done more? But I wanna remind you in context of how difficult a successful pursuit is, how rare it is to bag an entire army. Napoleon did it in 1806 when he beats and then pursues for about 250 miles his adversary. Very rare. And asking Meade to achieve that by any measure is simply unreasonable. So my last slide, thinking about Meade and the pursuit, I wanted Meade to have the last word. I wanted Meade to have the last word. July 14th, this is exactly what I expected. Unless I did impractical things, fault would be found with me. Two days later, this was the reason I was disinclined to take the command, and it is for this reason I would gladly give it up. I think if we look at Meade and the pursuit, Meade since June 28, he defeats Robert E. Lee, defeats the Army of Northern Virginia, he protects Washington, D.C., don't overlook that, and he drives the Army of Northern Virginia back into Virginia. And by any reasonable measure, those actions, Meade's actions, were successful. I am thrilled to have talked with you about this tonight, and I can't wait to see what your comments in the chat or throw them at me are going to be, so I can hear, um, I can hear from you. Thank you all for um, hanging in, and I'll stop screen share and um, come back and join you. Hi, Jennifer. Henry, <clears throat> I just wanted to thank you. It was a great and compelling presentation. Uh, let me open it up to the audience and see if they have any questions. I'm looking in chat right now. I don't see any questions there. So feel free to put them in. So um, let's hear your questions. I'm not going to give a question right now, but I got to say to you, in the years I've been doing this, that is probably one of the best lectures we've ever had. And I thank you for that. Thank you, Rich. Anybody, that's so kind. I don't think anybody realized, I think we were all led to believe that, you know, why didn't he catch him? And I, this is the second time I've heard this lecture. And I think I could hear it again. Uh, I should hear it. It's, I think it's that important. We really don't know. I think if we're presupposing we do know, but we don't know. Thank you for saying Henry, that. I appreciate that. No, I appreciate. Henry, read the questions or if uh, you can. I, fantastic I do what lecture. I, uh, I, I could read mine real quick, and that that was her pointing out the reality of war, which is that it's frequently just of attrition. Do you think that Lincoln did not understand the strategy that? Uh, plan of Winfield Scott, literally all the way back to Aaron Burr, was to flank the South and not to 
go headlong as it was in the Battle of Wilderness and just to, and go right at Virginia directly. So the whole plan was always to exhaust the South so they could never rise again. So Meade actually kept the big strategy by not losing. So do you think Lincoln was unaware of the big strategy? I think it's unpopular to criticize Lincoln uh, for a variety of reasons, but at the same time, I think that we need a little bit more objectivity to Lincoln as commander in chief. And um, there's gonna be some work that's coming out on that. Actually, Ken know my dissertation <laughs> is looking at uh, Lincoln as commander in chief, kind of revisiting some of these questions. And I can certainly say from my research on Meade, it seems that Lincoln fundamentally misunderstands several things about the Gettysburg campaign and the pursuit from the condition of the army to how practical it is to bag and annihilate these. And, and even when he says about Grant, you know, Grant has bagged the enemy. If only me could do that, it will be the literal end of the war. Well, the war in the West continues. It's not as if bagging Pemberton at Vicksburg ended the war. I'm, I'm certainly not gonna um, criticize Lincoln's military acumen in some ways, but I think it, in this case, his expectations are just fundamentally misplaced. And so are many of the Northern um, civilians and many people in the press equally so. And the president is directly uh, well, there are people of the people, no. isn't he? So the problem is the, no, the no, war couldn't even come close. Let, let her just finish on Meade. He never could have ended the war then. The South still had tons of energy to fight. Sherman didn't even exhaust them by cutting in the underbelly as they did with Yorktown as Rochambeau and Washington fought it out. It looks to me utterly ridiculous to think that Meade could have won that war right then and there. The South was not exhausted. They're still not exhausted. 150 years later, they think maybe the country would have been better off yeah. being split in two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's so, stick to the Jennifer, question point. Jennifer, uh, I have a, a question from Fernando from Venezuela. And he asks, do you think this was a moment when Lincoln realized General Meade was not the general he, Lincoln, needed to win the war, uh, especially, you know, up against um, Grant winning in Vicksburg? So Lincoln had two generals before him. Well, that's that's certainly true. Um, Hooker doesn't defeat Lee. Burnside doesn't defeat Lee. And really, McClellan doesn't either. So it's not as if he's got um, success on the early end of Meade taking command. Meade has achieved what no commander of the Army of the Potomac has yet done. So there's that. Secondly, when we look past July 19, and we look into late July, and this is what um, Jeff Hunt's going to do with you guys, I believe, and into August, September, October, the relationship between Meade, Lincoln, and Halleck continues to deteriorate. And these are really centered around the maneuvers across the Rapidan and the Rappahannock River that fall, Bristow Station, Mine Run, and Meade is continually under pressure to do more. And I mentioned when I showed you that slide about him offering his resignation on the 14th, that's the first time that Meade offers to resign, but it's not the last. He does so again in late July, he does so in mid-September, and he does again in mid-October. So you see Lincoln and Halleck and Meade never really coalescing in, in a grand strategy. Now, Grant, you might say that Meade's time is short in commanding the Army of the Potomac. Grant's arrival east mitigates that. Grant has the authority of where he wants to make his headquarters, and he does so with the Army of the Potomac. Grant also has the authority to put someone else in place. He meets with Meade and Culpepper, and if Grant thought that he might bring someone else east with him to replace him, that meeting changes his mind. Meade offers to step aside. Meade thinks that maybe Sherman, perhaps, is who Grant really wants. Meade writes about this, Grant writes about it, but ultimately they decide to keep the victor at Gettysburg. I can't really imagine that it would have been wise for either Grant or Lincoln to shelve the victor of Gettysburg, even as late as 1864. I can't believe that there would have been a better option. I mean, who, who's gonna take command? Um, Meade has done everything that's been asked of him to date. 
I have another and we feel question, the question from Chad. Dean, I have another question from Dean. Uh, is there a, an example of a successful pursuit after a three-day battle? Uh, Dean notes that Waterloo was a one-day battle. Yeah, so Waterloo is going to be a, a resolution in, in of itself, right? The one-day battle, complete capitulation of Napoleon's forces. <clears throat> Maybe you could think about Saratoga. That's a battle that's fought over several weeks. The, the first fighting is in September, fighting at Bemis Heights in October, and then the pursuit. The example that I gave on my slide, the Battle of Jena Ostad is a, is a kind of a twin battle, um, two different places fought on the 14th. I've looked, and I'm, I'm a trained academic military historian. So I have a healthy knowledge of military history beyond the Civil War. But I would encourage any of us to think of a battle that's that's successful and decisive, and then couple it to pivot to a pursuit that completely annihilates the enemy. The fact that we're all kind of pondering, mm, you know, thinking, racking our brains, tells us the answer, tells us the answer. So to apply standards that so few generals ever in military history achieved to George Meade is ridiculous and it's unfair. Um, Michael notes that 50 years later, World War I, uh, the Western Front was uh, a front of 450 miles long trench front warfare and uh, with casualties of half a million. So again, illustrating your point there. Yeah, exactly. And um, I've had a couple of questions asking the most important question, when is your book on Meet Out? <laughs> um, thank you for asking that. I am over halfway done. Mead, I'm currently working on the chapter of the North Anna campaign. So it's uh, May, about to turn to Cold Harbor, uh, June of 64. So I think I have about four or five chapters left. I have 14 done. So I've, I've definitely crossed the threshold. Um, the simple, more simple answer is, um, I expect probably to be writing through this calendar year yet. Um, Meade, of course, dies in 1872. So once I get through the war, there's not a lot that I have to handle relative to reconstruction and what Meade does after the war. So there's um, certainly light at the end of the tunnel for me. It's, it sounds like a big task before you. It, it is, y'all, and um, I, I hope maybe this generates a little bit of excitement, but I suspect, and, I, and I'm hopeful I get a big word count on this, you know, sometimes publishers don't like to print um, fat books, you know, like really lengthy ones, but I'm hopeful that I, I've got a bit of latitude here, and you'll see a me biography that's going to top about 500 pages. So it's it's a big project. I hope it makes an important contribution. I've been Absolutely thrilled working on it and, and very humbled if it adds to our understanding of, of George Meade and his contributions to Union victory. Well, Meade is a topic that would interest a lot of people here. We hit our uh, record here of 128 attendees. So uh, I think you've got a great topic there and a lot of interest uh, out there in the, in the marketplace. So let me just... Take just to come up with uh, three or four more questions and we'll end it and i just want to you know finish off tonight by saying good night okay go ahead no no do the three or four questions if you have them uh let's see i'm i'm seeing a lot of people uh saying it was a great presentation i think that is the last question i hear words like uh, spellbinding and informative so uh it was a great job a lot of thumbs up also uh, oh, here's one more. Meade had several sons. Did they follow him in into the military? So I, I showed you the photograph of, um, I hope I pointed it out, Captain Meade, George Meade, um, who was on Meade's staff. He joins Meade's staff in the spring of 63, and he will be with Meade during the duration of the war. He's the one that has the military service during the war, Captain George Meade. And he's the one, if you're familiar with um, Life and Letters, that will start to compile Meade's correspondence with Margaret, of which so much I shared with you, into what will become Life and Letters that's published in 1913, um, finished off by his grandson. All right. Um, let me just say 
understand the book. The people, again, what a, it was a really a great talk. The other thing is I want people who are watching this tonight, uh, this is the caliber of the programs of our roundtable. Uh, we've set a record tonight for a number of people. Dr. Murray's coming back in March, and Jeff Hunt will be here in February. So you don't have to ask me, but send our link out to your roundtables. Just send it out. You can see we can cover up the way we take out. Uh, we can handle up to 500 people. But uh, again, Dr. Murray, I want to thank you. Um, oh, wait, this, uh, let me just give a couple of thanks that are required. To, one that was through the Parsippany Library, carried by the Hackettstown Library, Roxbury, Rockaway, Chester, Plainfield. These are the library. Uh, these are the libraries that are handling our our program for us. And hopefully, now that you see it, for your individuals who are members, go to your town and just tell them it's free. Um, and I think that's where our, the educational process will be of you people out here doing it. Um, but I think that again, thank you, and I'm going to say good night to everybody here. So thank you. Good night. Good night everybody.